Hello all, um, good evening. Hello, good evening and welcome. Um, silly reference there, but uh, I thought I'd do something different this evening. Um, I've, I've got figures on the go, I've got some goblins from the Goblin Town set that I've discovered that I hadn't actually done, so I'm doing those at the moment. But I thought I'd just talk about, or possibly even start, a um, one of the memes that we often do in the community, you know, we did the, the Beckus commands and we did the paint for Waterloo and we do various things from time to time. So I was going to ask people to respond with what sort of got them into figure painting, wargaming, the hobby. Um, with me, I think it, I can trace it right back to when I was a kid and started getting airfix soldiers. My dad would buy me stuff from Woolworths and I got every airfix uh, 172 scale set that was available I mean all of them even the Italians and every time a new set would come out my dad would buy me the latest set probably when they were reduced knowing him um, yeah but yeah I had a, you know the Tarzan set I had the High Chaparral you name it you, you can look on the, the plastic soldier review every set I had you know the marching band the, the lot I mean it helps when you're born in 63 bit of a giveaway there but um, yeah so yeah that, that was the first sort of brush I had with it and of course me and my dad used to do the FX um, planes and he more or less finished the Bismarck on his own and he still does um, model kits to this day um, but I think the next thing was when I was about 13, 14, and one of the things that we did at school in those days was we had to do a an analysis of the Sutton Who burial. Who was it? What was the evidence? It was a sort of evidence-based detective story, and that really got me uh, interested in the Anglo-Saxon era, really, and the sort of analysis of history, the the um, not the objectivity, but you know, gathering the evidence together to come up with a co with conclusions and opinions. So I, I really enjoyed that particular um, module, I suppose you'd call it now, of the history curriculum at the time. And of course, I grew up very close to Hadrian's Wall. I was born within Hock Hockling. I'll call it Hockling distance. Any any of you from the, the northeast will know what Hockling means. So a hockling distance of course stopping in Roman Fort, which also my I discovered many, many, many years later that my great granddad was one of the original labourers on that site. He was a Corbridge born bloke. Um and I've got a couple of photographs of him actually working on the site, which is very nice, very rare to have photographs from a family like mine from that era but the reason why we got them is or we have them is because of course when they ran out of funds the guy who was doing it Mr Robson I think he was called he was a photographer type bloke from Hexham and he um, used to take photographs of the labourers to pay them with photographs instead and of course that's he used to sell photographs of the site to people visiting it as well um, just to get extra money to pay people and, and keep the, the works going and I think, I think the works there started in about 1906 or something like that I'll look it up on my family history website but I think it was about 1906 and of course with the advent of World War One, the whole thing ground to a halt because everybody went off to fight so yeah, growing up surrounded by Roman stuff and there's an awful lot of Saxon churches around there built by St Wilfred who was a big noise in the Anglo-Saxon era I think he bought he built um, seven churches along the Tyne Valley including Hexham Abbey there may have been a, a, a church there before but basically he claims the, the foundation of it and of course Hexham Abbey's got a, a fantastic crypt which if you go down there if you ever if we ever get out of our homes if you ever do visit um, Hexham go down into the crypt the, st so the stones were all stolen from the Roman wall 
So some of them bear the legionary marks of the 20th Valeria Victrix and the, I think the 6th Legion was there and well the 9th may have done some work on it as well before they miraculously disappeared. Only Doctor Who could solve that problem, couldn't he, really? Or Jamie Bell. Mm. Or Rosemary Sutcliffe, for that matter. That was another thing that influenced me as well, reading that. We, we had, I think we had to read that when we were at school. So, for my, what we call O-levels over here, um, if you're watching this elsewhere, that isn't in the UK, or Scotland, <laughs> then uh, it depends when you're watching this actually, doesn't it? That'll, that'll, that'll date it. Um, yeah, you do you do what you call ordinary levels, at, um, they're called GCSEs now. So you do those when you're 15, and I did history, which was the Tudors, I believe. And then I did A-level history, which was the Tudors and Stuarts, which got me interested in the War of the Three Kingdoms, the English Civil War, whichever term you want to use it. And also when I was 17, I did a, an extra role level, which was Roman history, and that was the Republican period of Rome, which was fascinating to me because it was people like um, the war against Hannibal, the Punic Wars, and the Gracchi, who were great social reformers, Marius's military reforms, fascinating stuff. I do like the Republican history to this day. Then for, as I say, I did an A-level in Tudors and Stuarts, and also did an A-level in ancient history, which was the Greek ancient world, and more of the Roman Republic. So you just went into, into the Roman Republic in, a, in more detail, but you also learnt about Persian Wars for the Greek side and the Peloponnesian War, which went on for about 25 years, I think. A long time anyway. But that, that was a. That, that really, really interested me. But while I was doing those two, <coughs> the history and the, and the classical. <coughs> excuse me. History and the classical stuff, I started getting interested more in the Anglo Saxon stuff. I picked up Frank Stinton's. Um, Oxford English History, which was the, his volume was about the Anglo-Saxons, and there's a massive detail in there. Um, it was written in 1936, but a lot of it is still valid, because you can't improve on it, really. You know, it, the, the, the records don't go away, it's still the same records. The Anglo-Saxons haven't left behind that much in the form of writs and charters, but we very, very rarely find anything else. So what Stenton wrote about them at the time is still valid. But yeah, I read that from cover to cover, which is when I suddenly realised that I really should get out more. Um, and I still realise that now. So yeah, I, I defy... I'd like to know anyone else who has actually read Frank Stenton's Anglo-Saxon history um, from cover to cover. I know I have. So as I say, I really should have been getting out more at that time. So, doing that, um, once I'd got my A-levels, I was more fascinated by the Anglo-Saxons. So, I discovered that at North London Polytechnic, they were doing a, a degree in history and classical civilization. So, that combined my Greek and Roman stuff with the... Very much, a lot of it was um, Anglo-Saxon stuff and the English Civil War. So, I decided to do that. There was a... The, bloke there before me apparently called Jeremy Corbyn who um, I think he did the, his first year and then flunked out no idea whatever happened to him I'm sure he's made a great success of something somewhere but I don't know time will tell so yeah that was three years well spent getting drunk in the bar and talking about um, Wessex and the Viking invasions and everything right up to the conquest so it was right up my alley enjoyed every every single minute of it after that um, started working in London and sort of kept up that interest um, behind me I've got a flipping library of 
books here. All history books from that time, um, which had this strange idea that, you know, my children actually do a history degree and use these books, but of course kids these days don't know how to read. They just don't read. They don't know what a book is. So they get everything on Wikipedia and sort of move away from there, but usually it just stops at Wikipedia. So that was always my dream that they'd um, pick these books up and start reading them, which is why I've got hundreds of them, because what I tend to do is read a, a, a fiction book, usually a sci-fi one, or and then I'll, once I've finished that I'll, I'll go back onto a history book. So I've done more damned history since leaving university than I actually did there, which I think once you've got the, the love of it inside you, you, you just don't give up. You've always got a desire to keep learning and carry on. So I do know a lot about various periods. So the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Tudors, the Stuarts, not so big on the medieval stuff. The Anglo-Saxons, definitely. The Vikings, definitely. Um, Viking Age Europe, so the Carolingians, and before that the Merovingians, which was all, basically we did feudal society, so it was about that, how feudal society came about, and its its origins and castle building, which started in Anjou, obviously, by Fulk Noir, no less, Fulk the Black. And that's once I started work I, my girlfriend at the time bought me some Prince August moulds of um, Napoleonic figures she bought me the British infantry don't think she bought moulds for anything else I think she just got me a, a, a starter set actually no it was a starter set it was the starter set with some French infantry French line infantry and British line infantry <coughs> and I bought more metal and started moulding those and painting them not very well which is when I got grabbed by some mates of mine at work who would just come across this thing called Dungeons and Dragons so we started buying figures for that and painting them and some of the guys who joined the group were absolutely brilliant painters so I learned a lot of those about would you believe washes and dry brushing heaven forbid because that was a completely new concept to me. The, I think in the, the sort of Red Dwarfs and Dragon magazines at the time, they just showed painted figures. There wasn't really much going on about how to actually get them painted or techniques and tips, and there certainly wasn't any YouTube stuff about that, which is what I like about YouTube now. You know, people paint stuff to do the odd figures myself as well and put a few paint ups on there how I've actually done things. <laughs> Some of you may have watched them. But yeah, so it was through the D&D &D route and then kids came along and like lots of people, all, all that went by the wayside. Didn't do anything until my son was about, I don't know, five, six years old. My daughter had come along as well, so he was born in 2000. So yeah, he may have been, may, they may have been a bit older than that. Um, and I thought I'd get some figures off eBay because I started watching Blucher 1815 Red by then and thought wow he was the first one I stumbled across on, on the YouTube community actually and thought wow this this guy does some good stuff and of course once you start watching one of his videos it leads you to someone else and someone else and someone else and you stumble across various reprobates like Ringo and um, Fraser von Ketteringham and British Legion, <laughs> the usual suspects, to name just a few, but those those are some of the first few that I watched, so that sort of really inspired me to get in and um, start painting again. Starting with uh, Napoleonics, also my father at the time was doing the HMS Victory, one of those Del Prado things that cost you about £10,000 to buy on a weekly subscription whereas you could have just bought the whole model for about two grand but he likes doing it that way he likes the magazine that comes with it and spending the ten grand over various years and he has done a, a nice job but he basically didn't want to do the figures himself and they were 15 millimeter sailors some of them climbing the rigging and various marines and all that so he sent them down 
in a envelope to me and said, get on with him soon. So I did. That's how he speaks as well. Just like me. <coughs> so yeah, he sent them down and said, um, I don't fancy painting them myself, but it's a sort of father bonding thing with his eldest son and heir. He let me get on with them and I took them up to him when I finished, finished with them and he was, he was very happy with that. So that was another thing that sort of dragged me back in. So yeah, that's basically me for that. Um, be interested in hearing your, your own little stories about, you know, what what bits of the, the hobby you like the most. I like, I, me personally, I like the, the model making side of it. I like the, the crafting side of it. I like the painting the figures. I do get a game going every once in a while, but really haven't done any for quite some time. I've had a game behind me set up here for... Must be getting on for nearly three years now, ready to go. Now should be the time to do it because I'm, I'm running out of storage space to actually put all these flipping figures in. I discovered three extra storage boxes the other day which were filled pretty damn rapidly because they've just been sitting on the war games table there for a while waiting for a home. So much clutter up here that needs to be sorted out. I really should be spending the time in this opportunity to do it but you know what <laughs> I need something to motivate me so hopefully um you've enjoyed it was uh, Star Wars day yesterday may the fourth be with you which is why I'm wearing this so yeah love to hear your, your own little stories your own little histories about how you came into it and what you enjoyed about it so if you've lasted this far I take my hat off and um, nice doing a different one for a change. You lot all take care out there and would love to hear your stories as well. And if you've liked my story, then um, please tell me. Love, would be love to hear from you. Okay, you take care and um, see you soon. <laughs>